Therefore, when you look in Ephesians chapter 2, ethnicity is recognized, but ethnicity is not idolized. It is respected, but it is not reverenced. Christ is. Christ is. That he reconciled, that he might reconcile us both to God in what? Two bodies? One body. Through two crosses? A cross for the Anglo, for the Jew, or for the Anglo and the darker? No. One new man in the place of two, so making peace. Welcome to the Father's State. I am Jesse Lee Peterson. Thank you so much for being with me. The Father's State is now on Locals.com. Locals.com. So click the link in the description to support our work. Thank you all. I do appreciate it. I have with me Pastor Seymour Heligar. He is the head of, he is the head pastor of the Grace Community Church in Long Beach. California. Thank you, sir, for coming. Thanks for having me. Appreciate I do it. appreciate it. How long have you been a pastor? I've been a pastor for about eight years. Eight years? Almost nine. Yeah. Oh, and so what made you just, did, did God call you to be a pastor or you went to, church, uh, to school to be one? Well, I believe the call preceded the training. So I believe God called me uh, into the ministry, was uh, verified by uh, some of the mentors in my life. And then from there, I felt the, the need to pursue further training to, to equip me to serve God's people. And so he called you and then it was verified by somebody? Confirmed or affirmed. I, I, I see like the, the calling as an objective part where God calls. That's the objective reality. Right. The subjective elements is, okay, I sense the call. I believe I'm called. Um, and then that was affirmed uh, by some of the, the leaders in the church during that time. And, and how did they affirm that God had called you? What did they do or say? Well, in examining the life and the character, but also the teaching gifts, according to First uh, Timothy chapter 3, those were some of the evaluations uh, that they made to affirm it. And why did you have to go to school? How will a school tell you what God will have you to say and do? Yeah, there, I think there are several aspects to training. It depends, I think, on where the person is. Um, historically, there have been great preachers uh, like um, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, uh, Dr. David Martin Lord Jones out of Wales, who also pastored a church in England uh, called Westminster Church. Um, these men were not formally trained, um, and they were gifted speakers. And then there's, uh, there's the other side where um, what I see is over the years, uh, some uh, churches have failed to adequately prepare uh, men for ministry. Um, I see 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, the things that you've heard and seen uh, from me among witnesses entrust to others who will be able to teach others also. So the training ground for ministry is really in the local church, but the local church has been, I think, deficient uh, in that area. Now, the other part for me was more wanting to understand the original languages. Um, I couldn't train myself in it as effectively, so the seminary helped me grapple with the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek uh, texts of, of the scriptures. Okay. Um, in the scripture, it says, let no man teach you but the Holy Spirit would teach you all things. Why would you let some man teach you the Bible or anything at all? There's, I think, a dual reality. The Holy Spirit teaches, but he also uses human instruments uh, too. So I don't see the two as mutually exclusive, but inclusive um, uh, to where uh, Paul trained Timothy um, and he was on his tutelage, but also Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 was trained or taught the scriptures uh, by his grandmother and his mother. Really? So, so training is, is not foreign to uh, the scripture through human instruments because the agency is still the Holy Spirit. It's just a matter of which, which route will that take? Is that more exclusive studying without the personal help or a combination of the two? So I believe the Holy Spirit uses all of that. Are you married? Yes, sir. You are married. Mm -hmm. If your wife woke up one morning and said, oh, honey, the Lord didn't call me. I want to be a preacher now. I'm going to be one. Would you let your wife be a preacher? That's totally subjective and unbiblical. So no. <laughs> uh, under the, the authority of the scripture, she cannot. Yeah. Um, there's a role women can play. Titus chapter 2 uh, commends the women to teach other women how to love their husbands, love their children, and be homemakers. 
So I believe uh, mentoring other women is, is the, the calling for women when it comes to teaching other women, but not in the capacity of pastor or preaching or shepherding a congregation. Why do you think so many preacher, men preachers have caved into their wives and their female church members and allowed them to be pretend that they are preachers? Why has that happened? I think one area that I would think about is that I, I don't believe that they're exercising biblical leadership authority. Um, if the scriptures are the final authority, uh, then you submit to the scriptures and then you lead on to that biblical authority. I think there's an abandoning of that reality. I would say on the <clears throat> observational side, I perceive that there are some areas where they are, their wives are preaching and I think it adds to uh, the finances in the home. I do believe there's some financial implications uh, if you had a relatively large church and your wife is also pastoring, with, quote, pastoring because there are no female pastors with you or she's serving in that capacity, I think there's a monetary aspect too. Oh, so you're doing it for the money. Yes, their motive is not the glory of God, so it has to be something else. Yeah, and so do you think that's why they have preacher schools too, seminaries and all that? Because as far as I know, in the good old days, when boys were boys and men were men, and a man became a preacher, he didn't, he didn't go to school to be a preacher, God let him. Uh, is that a money-making thing to really tell men now that you need to go to seminaries and all that kind of stuff? You is know, that a money-making thing? There's always that possibility. Um, the seminary I went to and trained under, the, the, the seminary was on the church campus. So it was an extension of the church, which I think true training for ministry is done on a grassroots level at a local church. Um, if you train men there, it's the training process is doing the work of the ministry, serving in uh, the teaching capacity or, or shepherding capacity. You learn more effectively on the job in ministry. Right. Um, if an institution supplements it and, and helps a local church, that's not a bad thing. It all depends on motive. One thing I said earlier, too, is that um, it depends on where that person is in their capacity to, to study the scriptures effectively. Some people are sharper than others. Some need to be sharpened. And so I think the seminary can, can help in that area where there's, there's a lack. It's like, a, you know, you, you want the best doctor. You don't want a doctor who says, hey, I'm called to be a doctor, but I don't have the credentials. Now, I know there's a difference with the Holy Spirit working and the divine work of grace in the preaching ministry. But I think it is a good thing to be as equipped as possible using the means that God allows. Uh, speaking of doctors, would you rather have an affirmative action doctor or a non-affirmative action doctor? I want a trained doctor. <laughs> like I want a trained pilot. Right. The ethnicity is irrelevant to me. Is well, are you qualified were, for the job? Yeah. How about if they were affirmative action doctor though? And let's say you lay in there bleeding and there are two doctors standing there and one doctor is affirmative action doctor and the other doctor is a doctor who earned his way. Would you prefer to earn his way or an affirmative action one day? I want the one who worked to get to where he is now. Yes. yes. Amazing. Yes, I do. So does your wife obey you? Yes, sir. In no. the Lord. In the Lord. As long as I don't mislead her with lies or deception, she submits and obeys. She's but, a very submissive wife. Oh, she is? Praise God for that, yes. But how would she know if you lead her with lies or whatever? Well, it has to be in the Lord, right? Uh, there's uh, Ephesians 2 says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Right. That is as if you're submitting to the Lord. So you see your husband in the way you see the Lord Jesus Christ. So your submission right. to your wife, uh, the wife's submission to her husband is contingent on the level of her submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's hard to find a woman today that has truly submitted to God. It's a battle. It's a Genesis 3 thing since the fall. Her yeah. desire is to rule over her husband yeah. and, uh, you know, her desire is for him to rule him and then his desire is to rule over her sinfully. So we realize that the effects of the fall are, are the ramifications are still there. But it is, it is a glory. It is a glorious sight when a man serves his wife and leads God in a godly way and a beautiful sight when the wife submits him. I don't think there's anything better than that, that picture. Yeah, it is nice. Yeah. Um, how do you deal with the hell in your wife? You know, you wake, she come, you come home one day from work. When you get home tonight, she's going to be ticked. Where you been all day? You didn't call me three or four times like you normally. Uh, you, I called you, your cell phone went to answer right away. Or you wake up in the morning, you all smile, you had a good night's sleep. She wake up ticked already. What are you smiling about? How do you deal with that hell in her? 
Well, I don't know if there's a hell in my wife, but there's sin and there's a struggle for submission sometimes or just the, the, the right choice of words in, in every human being, male or female. Um, I think... So for the guys who have to try to deal with the hell, tell them how you deal with the hell in your wife when it comes out like that. Well, it depends on, first of all, what my motive is. Um, but the, the motive for me shepherding my wife is so that she may love the Lord Jesus Christ with all of her heart, soul, mind, and strength. When she does that, she loves her neighbor as herself, and that is that would be me, her closest neighbor. So if the objective is vertical, it's easy to persuade a wife who is a follower of Christ, who have turned from their sin, trusted in Christ as Savior, there's a different response when you correct them yeah. than you do an unbelieving uh, yeah. spouse. That's true. So if I lead them to the truth, if I lead her to the truth, and my objective is for her to see Christ in the conversation, then she's easily won over because she knows the objective is vertical, not horizontal. Um, do you see the hell, do you see the devil in her sometimes? Do you ever argue with the devil in her? No, I never have to argue with the devil. Um, not with my wife, maybe <laughs> with other people, but certainly not with my wife. Do you, do you believe that human beings are in a fallen state? Absolutely. And what yes. is the fallen state? The fallen state has to do with what happened in Genesis chapter three. And Romans chapter 5 declares it, uh, that through the sin of one man, when it entered into one man, all of sin, the fallen state is uh, when, when men and women, uh, due to their spiritual death, uh, are separated and alienated from God, and they're rebelling against God. Yeah. So in birth, everyone inherits, because of Adam's uh, transgression and his disobedience, everyone inherits a sin nature. It's a fallen sin nature and is only restored in regeneration, a new birth from above where God invades the darkness, the sin, the death, the bankruptcy, the hostility, and he gives them life, regeneration, a new birth to respond to the good news, to turn from the sin and believe in the gospel. Until then, they'll remain fallen and separated from God. So it's true that every human being, every person that's born through the woman is born into sin. Yes. And that's why we must be born of the spirit of the Father. Yes, we must, born, we must be born again. Amazing, huh? Uh, what's important to you? What's important to me is the glory of God. What does that mean? It means that everything I do, uh, God is recognized. He's glorified. He's honored. Um, the, the word glory is the, the Hebrew word for weight. It, it, it means that I value or I esteem someone. Um, who's filled with riches. God is glorious in his, his character, his goodness, his faithfulness. And so my desire is to glorify the Father and the Son uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, do you have anger? I can potentially, yes, have moments where I become angry, yes. And, and, and do you have love? Yes. You have both? Yes. How can you have, ride, ride two horses? Because anger is of the devil, and love is of God, the real love. How can you have both? Depends on what the definition, I guess, of anger would be. Uh, there's, there is a, an anger which is a right response uh, to sin. Like there's, there's righteous uh, anger when, when wrongs are done, when injustices are committed, or, or lies and slanderous reports are made. And that's discernment, though. Yes, but it, it is still a, it's still a, a response and a call for justice or judgment. And right. so there's, there's a righteous response of anger. And then there's a the sinful anger um, that desires something so much that, that it acts out in, in violent thoughts or even words um, or attitudes that I would deem are sinful. Do you have that one? I've had it from moment to time to time, the te either the temptation or acted out in anger, absolutely. And you, so you still have that? It is something that I would say that is mortified. That means that by the grace of God, I'm, I'm able to put it to death so it doesn't rain. I do believe, according to the scriptures, that um, in salvation, sin no longer reigns. Uh, Romans chapter 6 says, sin no longer reigns in immortal bodies because now you're a slave of righteousness and no longer a slave of sin. But there's a difference, I believe, between reigning sin and remaining sin. Because we're in this, this natural body uh, that has uh, been affected by the fall. Um, there will be battles and fights with remaining sin. If that were not the case, then most of the letters written in the New Testament would not need to be written because they were written with two churches, and most of them are written to churches with sin issues, and he still called them saints in Christ. And so why having 
because anger is the spirit of the devil. We've made a home in the imagination and it makes you feel a certain way, good or bad and all that. Why have you, why haven't God taken that spirit completely away from you? There's a process I would say is called progressive sanctification. What does um, that mean? In other words, moment by moment, day by day, I'm becoming more like Christ. So, so you're coming, overcoming the spirit of the devil day by day and moment by moment? I would say that the spirit of the devil, um, the way the scripture frames it in Ephesians chapter 2, it says there are two worlds, right? One world is a, the way we live according to the prince of the power of the air, that is Satan. Yeah, and, that, and then the, the new world that we live in in Christ is, is according to the image of God, but the scripture says that we're being renewed. Right. The word being renewed is, is this, this active, ongoing work of the Spirit of God to conform us to be more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and that, that state of just absolute bliss and sinless perfection um, is not expected in this world, but we should pursue it in this life. It's something we should pursue, but not necessarily attain. Why you say it's not expected in this world? Because this body is still subjected to death. It's subjected to death because of sin. If sin were completely removed from it, then we no longer subjected to death. But the reality is we're still dying and death has to do with sin. But God is in this world. He said, be holy as he is holy and be, uh, and, and sin not because those who sin are of their father, the devil. And so, and, and just to understand, are you saying that God is taking the, the spirit of the devil away from your mind and emotions? I don't, see, I don't, I don't call it the spirit of the devil. Well, um, that's what it is, though. In, we just agreed it was the spirit of the devil. It's, it's indwelling sin that I would say the adversary Satan will monopolize on. Uh, because we can't be possessed by God or the devil. Now, can Satan whisper thoughts and words in our ears? Yes, so he can do that. Possession. He can possess, he can, he can oppress the Christian, but he can no longer possess them. But he possessed their imagination. That's why a lot of their thoughts and things like that. Yes, that, now that's, that's why God said yes. bring all thoughts into captivity because they can make you feel a certain way, a false sense of love and a false, you know, hate, and you're up and down emotionally. And... And but once you're born of the Spirit of God, doesn't He destroy the devil in the mind? He He destroys the stronghold. the The power of sin is broken. But you think about passages like First John chapter one. It commands us not to sin, but if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Right. So the expectation is that we should not, because we're no longer. Uh, um, under the domain of the rule of Satan. We should be pursuing righteousness by the power of God. He's given us the power to do so. But it, it also realized that there's still indwelling sin. Uh, Galatians 5 says that the flesh was against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. So you, should, you do not do the things that you ought to do. So there's a battle. And within that battle, there are moments, moments that we may lose in the interim. The key difference between, I say, the believer and the unbeliever, at least one of them, is that our response to sin is different. We hate the sin. We hate the sin we commit. We hate the thoughts. We hate the lust. Well, we, we, when you we, we hate, hate it, you, um, I don't know exactly what you mean by it, but when you hate it, you get deeper into it. But when you see it for what it is, you overcome it because you see that it's not you. By the light of God, you see that it's not you, and you overcome it. But when you hate it, it will control you. When you discern it, it cannot control you. The hatred I'm referring to, though, is I believe is a, is a holy response to sin. So you're being discernment. It's... it's well, then what is, what, what, when you said discernment, what? The ability to see it and know that it's not you. And that way you don't identify with it. Then the, the light of God will destroy the darkness. Okay. And I, I would say that on that part of discernment, I do agree that that element of discernment is there. But I don't think there is a necessarily a conflict between discernment and also a, a holy indifference towards sin, no matter whose sin it is. Like I may see what's happening in the news and some atrocity, some, right. some evil committed against a person. And, and that may evoke some response. I also now have the same response to my own sin because I know it doesn't glorify the Father, doesn't bring him honor. So I think there's both the discernment, but also the holy indifference that I believe is a healthy approach. Do you believe that all thoughts are all lies all the time, no such thing as a true thought? Except we, for practical thoughts, how to build a house, how to have a meal. But do you believe that all thoughts of the imagination is a lie? I believe because we're created in the image of God, 
that, that there, there's some thoughts and ideas, if they reflect our creator, are good. If those thoughts do not reflect the creator, then they're not good thoughts. Um, but do you believe that the imagination is a lie? When you say imagination, because we... Well, you know, God said bring all thoughts into captivity. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that, because all thoughts are of the devil, they're not of him. And when you believe a thought, you believe it and worship in the devil. Uh, so that's why he said bring every one of them into captivity. And that my voice is a voiceless voice, and my children shall know me by that, by the revelation, and not by the thoughts. And, but I noticed that a lot of Christians still believe in the thoughts, and they worship the devil thinking that they're worshiping God. On that, I would say that uh, that passage uh, you referred to in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, um, he says, though, though we war, walk in the flesh, we do not war in the flesh. In other words, the conflict that the believers were experiencing in Paul's apostleship was in question uh, in that particular epistle, that second letter to the church in Corinth. And he's saying that I, I am not fighting your spiritual battles through carnal means, through hateful words or right. hateful actions. Yeah. He says, I'm, I'm taking those thoughts captive, then I'm bringing those thoughts to the obedience of Christ until your obedience is fulfilled. And, and so, that's the imagination, all right? Yeah, he's, he's literally saying, I, I am going to bring every thought, I'm going to scrutinize everything that happens under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So... What we have to do with our thoughts, we have to have biblical words to replace those thoughts, but we have to be willing to scrutinize and analyze our thoughts in light of the scriptures to see whether or not those thoughts are encouraging, good, healthy, because the Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, whatever is, whatever is good, whatever is right, whatever is just, whatever is praiseworthy, it says to think on those things. But the, the root of those thoughts is the character and the word of God not our own thoughts, subjective thoughts that are not submitted to the authority of the scripture. But human beings don't know good. They don't know what's good and they don't know what's right. It has to be, once they're born of the spirit of God, he will show them what's good. And the thoughts are never good. There's no such thing. Do you create your own thoughts? Well, the source of everything good is God. God created the mind, the brain, but it's been affected by the fall. But the, the okay. doctrines that... Um, that was used years ago to describe it was called total or radical depravity. In other words, every part of our human makeup has been affected by the fall. So therefore, our thoughts have been affected, our motives affected. So therefore, our heart and deeds will be affected, affected by that. So sin's pollution is in the mind, and that is only cleansed by, as Scripture says, the washing of the Word of God. It's the Scriptures and the Spirit of God that cleans the mind. And Do you create your own thoughts? I, I am responsible for all of my sinful thoughts. God gets the glory for all of the good thoughts. Do you create your own thoughts? I am responsible for all of my sinful thoughts. Now, when you say so create... Are you saying you, and are you saying to me, you say you're responsible for them is because you create them? I guess the word create for me, I think of ex nihilo. In, in other words, what? ex nihilo, it means I created something out of nothing. Um, so I, I, I don't, I won't, I won't use the word create, but I will use the word responsible. I am responsible. If for you don't thoughts. create them, how are you responsible for them? Because they're mine. And how are they yours? Because they came from my mind. And so the bad thoughts that come from your mind, they're yours too? Yes. And the good thoughts that come from your mind, they're yours too? The good thoughts? No, those are from God. And so... And so, and so the bad thoughts are from you, and the good thoughts are from God? Yes. What the? Uh, and, wh and why would you create bad thoughts from your own mind? Because I'm still struggling with sin. Um, I, I, I would love to have a mind that was sinless and perfect. But why would you do it then? But it's not. By the grace of God, I'm growing. I would say this. I, I, I am not what I would like to be, but by the grace of God, I'm not what I used to be. Is there, there, there has been. There's been growth in that area, but there's room for improvement in the mind. Is there person. a possibility you are not creating the bad thoughts either? They are from the devil? Um, I think on the level of responsibility, the devil is not to be blamed for any thoughts, but he encourages them. Um, uh, he, he provides an opportunity to have those thoughts, whether it's lustful thoughts uh, on the billboard or on the, on the television show. Uh, he's a prince of the power that he, 
he, he monopolizes on the moments to, to those thoughts when they first come through my mind and I'm tempted as Jesus was, if I resist the temptation and, and, and say, well, it is written, the scripture says, I love the Lord my God, I, I think thoughts that are biblical, uh, that, that is a temptation, it's not a sin. The, the adversary wants me to give into that temptation to pursue the sinful thoughts and to encourage those sinful thoughts. So, so the adversary, the devil who made a home in your mind, in the flesh, no, he cannot the make flesh a, and he cannot, emotion. He cannot make, me personally, as I see the scripture, he cannot abide in me if I'm in Christ, but certainly the believer. I've been freed from him. I'm in the domain of light. But it is, it's, these are my sins, not his. But what he does is he monopolizes. He takes advantage of them and he will tempt me to, to give into those thoughts. Why don't you get rid of all of them? As by the grace of God, they're <laughs> dropping day by day. But mm -hmm. as I would tell you, I can't guarantee that tomorrow will be any different. My really? trust is in God. What's a good thought, a God thought? You I, said the good ones are from God and the bad ones are from you. Mm -hmm. But no credit to the devil at all. No, no, I what, would uh, no, I would never because I would never give him glory. I would never credit him. He's he is he's a formidable foe. Uh, one song says that we're no match for him. None on earth is right. his equal. So that that is true. Yeah. Um, uh, he is the father of lies, right? right? And if we are his children, then we are children of the devil. So then we are liars as well. But when God saves us, he removes us from that domain, that kingdom. But with that kingdom, that removal, there's still some of the residual effects of sin in, in the human flesh. He transfers us to the kingdom of light. Satan no longer has access to our bodies, our minds. So he tries to do it indirectly. Uh, by tempting us and, and enticing us to do those things. But those thoughts in our minds and in our minds, we're responsible for our sins before God. We're the ones that the devil didn't make us to do it. But if that's the case, why did God say of ourselves we can do nothing and we know nothing? If he, if, if he thought that we were responsible for our thoughts, why would he say, well, at least you can control or get rid of your own thoughts? But he said, we know nothing, we can do nothing because it's all spiritual, a battle between good and evil. Why do you take credit for the negative thoughts? I don't take credit, I take responsibility. Well, why do you take responsibility for uh, the negative thoughts if they're not your own? Oh, well, they're mine because it, it comes from my own heart. Jesus said this. Well, your heart has not changed? Well, the sin, Jesus said in Matthew 15, doesn't come from the mind. Um, the mind is, is a fact that Jesus says that these things proceed from the heart. Out of the heart, he says, one of the sins is wicked thoughts. Wow. So your heart is still wicked? No, he says these things come from the heart. Now, so is your heart still wicked? When, when God saves us, he gives us a new nature. He gives us a heart of flesh so that he can write his words on our heart. But the body is still affected by the fall. Therefore, those sins uh, can still be challenging. So your heart is still wicked? I have a heart of flesh. But, but, the, but, but not a heart of love? If, if I have a heart of, of flesh from God and God is love, then yes. But do you have a heart of love or a heart of flesh? The Lord, God has given me, by His grace and His Spirit, right? It is a spiritual work where He gives me all of the gifts that He promised in Christ, which is the fruit of the Spirit is, is love, joy, peace, patience. But in that same book of Galatians, Paul talks about the, the battles, the conflicts that we have, and those conflicts are sinful conflicts. So there's still issues of sin that remain, but the Spirit of God enables us to overcome them. And so do you have a, a heart of love or a heart of... Uh, flesh. God has given. Which one do you have? God you? has given me, um, by His Spirit, the grace and the ability to love. So you have a heart of love. But I am still dealing with sin. Oh, I see. So your heart is of love and wickedness. No, no, it's not. It's not a heart of love and wickedness. It's it's uh, as uh, I think Luther called, said it very well. We're simultaneously saints and sinners. Uh, because we're still dealing with the effects of the fall. If that were not the case, then we don't need to have a glorified body. If, if we achieve perfection now, why the glorified body? The glorified body has to do with the realities that our body is not presently conformed to the glorious body of the risen Savior, who rose so that we may be glorified in the future. So there, clearly there's indications of present indwelling sin that impedes that absolute bliss of glorious perfection. Where is the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven is really, at this point, it is a, a doctrine of principle that speaks of, of God's rule. 
uh, it is not a place as much as it is where God is. And where is the kingdom of God, of heaven? God, when, he, when our Savior or God speaks of the kingdom of heaven, he's speaking presently of the people that he's calling to himself who will one day rule eternally and reign with him. So the kingdom of heaven begins with the conversion of sinners, the salvation of sinners. So and then, where is the kingdom of heaven? It is not a domain. It is. Are you saying it exists nowhere? No, it's not that it is nowhere. Where the, is the, it? The, the kingdom of heaven is, is, not an, is not a physical location at this point. Uh, the, the kingdom of heaven, God is building his kingdom by calling saints to salvation. And then according to Revelation, at the end of the age, he's going to recreate the, the, the new heavens and the new earth. And then that is where we'll see the final state of the kingdom. When Jesus was asked, ask, where is the kingdom of heaven? What did he say? And what passage was that? The... When Jesus was asked, where is the kingdom of heaven? What did he say? Well, who asked him that question? The, the, some of those following people that were disciples. And he says, like he that. says the kingdom of heaven is near you or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right. And so and he said it is within. It's right here. It's, it's, in, it's within. He was referring to, but I think in that text he was referring to himself, not the people. No, he said we should look for the kingdom within us, not outside of us, because it's within. And if someone tells you to look here or look there or look yonder, don't do it because the kingdom of heaven is within. Why don't you know that? Well, it's not, it's not that I don't know that. When, when Jesus speaks of the kingdom of heaven being within, uh, I do believe that's also connected to salvation, uh, the work of grace and regeneration. But the kingdom of heaven also to do, has to do with the king who rules. So there's... there's but he a, didn't say any, anything like that. He just told I, them... Actually, he did... That the he, kingdom of heaven is within... Well, he did say at the beginning of the Gospels that the, the, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was actually the first message he stated about the kingdom of heaven. He's telling the people, I am, I am the king ushering my kingdom. This is how the kingdom is built. Believe in me. Trust in me. Uh, his message was, first of all, to the Jews, to let them know that he's come to rule and to reign. And the beginning of that rule and that reign is the subjection of sinners to him in salvation. And so the kingdom begins at that stage when, when sinners believe and trust. They're, they're, they're ushered into the kingdom uh, of God. So you don't know that the kingdom of heaven is within you? Yes, I do believe that the kingdom of, of heaven is within us. There's a, and do you know that? There's the already not yet phase and, and of it. Do you it. know that when he was speaking of the kingdom being in us, he was talking about the spiritual kingdom and not a physical place? It is both and. But it did is, you know he was talking about the spirit kingdom and not the physical kingdom? It's both. There's, no, there's, no, Matthew, did you know he meant the spiritual kingdom that is within us? Or do you think he was talking about the physical kingdom? I do believe the stress, and this is far as I do believe that the stress on that kingdom being within has to do with salvation, has to do with Christ who rules as king. When Christ rules as king, the kingdom is within. Um, without that kingship and salvation, there is no kingdom. But there's also a physical kingdom, a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness will dwell eternally. And so there, those are two realities that I think the scripture also emphasizes. But in the New Testament, it was all about the Old Testament is done, is over. The job is finished. The devil has been just, uh, defeated. The kingdom of heaven, of course, is in heaven above, but it's in us as well. And that is in the kingdom within that we should look for him. And it's the kingdom within that we should live from and not from without. Why don't a lot of preachers know about that kingdom? And that the word is written in our heart, not in the Bible, but in our heart. Why don't preachers know that? I'm not sure I understand when you say it's not in the Bible, it's in our heart. Um, the scripture says in 2 uh, Timothy chapter 3 that all scriptures inspired God breathed. That means that would be the Bible. Genesis but does it Revelation. say that that's what that means in the Bible? Yes, all scriptures God breathed. So, but, um, so when, the, when the disciples were following him, the truth that they understood was inspired by God. But he, writ, he wrote it upon our hearts, and now it is in our hearts, and when we enter into that kingdom, we are inspired by the Spirit of God of the heart. 
because the, the word is made flesh within us. Do you agree with that? I can't say I agree. What I can say is what the scripture affirms. Uh, I believe what it teaches. Um, <clears throat> when Jesus res was rose, raised from the dead in the resurrection, Luke chapter 24, uh, this great theme there on the road to Emmaus. Uh, he was walking and some disciples were, were walking with him, going back to Jerusalem, and they, they talked about the history and things went wrong. They were like, you are not here to witness all this. And what Jesus did was Jesus referred to the scriptures, the Old Testament, and taught them all the things concerning him. You go to the early church. The early church, when they preached, they, Stephen, in, in fact, in, in, uh, in Acts, he preached based on the Old Testament. When, when Paul said all scriptures that God breathed, he was referring to the Old Testament scriptures because most of the New Testament scriptures were not written as yet. Uh, the history of, of God's work in Revelation has been write these truths down, record these truths. He said that to Moses, and, and they've been recording and writing God's word ever since. What hedges the Christian from, from you know, the, the wrong thoughts or the presuppositions or, or error in teaching is that we have a basis and the basis is the word of God and God has always used his own word because it's his soft revelation to us. Do you believe that the Bible is the word of God or the word from God? Uh, the Bible is the very words of God. And uh, why do you say that? Because the scripture says that uh, uh, every word of God is pure. Um, like the Bible furnace, is not pure. Like, firmest, fir like in a furnace tried seven times. Uh, there's Do you also believe a, that the Bible is pure? I also, the scriptures? Do you believe the Bible is pure? Oh, I, oh absolutely. I, I do believe well, it, that. It's been rewritten over and over and over down through the years based on men and what they thought and what they believe and, and, and the culture around them. How can it be pure when it's been tampered with? There's a, there's a reference we use and we say the, the word of God is inspired and errant. Uh, it's infallible. We're referring to what the Bible says, the scripture says about itself. And uh, because scripture attests to this, it, God says the same thing in, in Isaiah 55, my word will not return void, but will accomplish the thing that I've said. It is, it is God uh, who, who commanded the writing of the scripture. And um, we have had reliable uh, copies and manuscripts over the years uh, that would say that the translations that we do have are reliable translations based on some of the manuscripts that we do have. So th there's, a, there's a, a sense of reliability there. On the flip side, we, we have um, secular uh, books and uh, documents written that may have three or fewer manuscripts, and we will still credit the author for those things. Uh, the, the New Testament um, uh, has several thousand reliable copies that we can say sufficiently match to the original language. So, there's a, so there's a level of confidence that we have in, in the scripture's transmission over so the years. So do you personally doubt that the, the word of God is written on your heart and the kingdom of heaven is within? You doubt that? No, I do not believe it's to the exclusion of the, the written word. No, Matthew, something different now. Do you doubt that the word of God is written on your heart and the kingdom of heaven is within? No, I do not doubt it. Do and, you know that it is? And Yes, I, I do believe God writes his word in our heart, but the writing is not a once and for all thing. It's, it's a progressive work of writing his word in our heart. It's a continual process. And then the psalmist... Uh, you don't think everything of God is there right now in our hearts? As far as what he wants us to know? His word, yeah. Yeah, if you studied all of it, yeah, then it's No, I, you don't believe that it's already written in our heart? Without the scripture. Right. No, he said he's going to write his law in our hearts. So, so He said he's going to. Yes. And do you believe that it's written upon your heart already? I believe God continues to write his word in my heart. But, but you don't believe that it's in the fullness, it's not completed on your heart at this point? I believe based on the scripture's teaching that the writing is a progressive thing. The heart of flesh is permanent. So like, you think that God is like writing on your heart every day like you don't believe it's done? Well, when, when the scripture speaks of writing on our heart, it is obviously a, a metaphor, right? Uh, that, that God is, is going to, by his spirit, reveal his word to us. But he reveals his word through the use of the scriptures. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, that from a childhood you have known the scriptures. He says, which is able to make you wise unto salvation. But I don't quite understand something. I just, for you personally, as a pastor, you don't believe that the word is written upon your heart and it's done I don't understand uh, what you mean by like it's done. Like, 
when God completed the New Testament, it was done. When Christ was on the cross, he said it was done. Do, you don't believe that happened? Do I believe that there's, there's no more revelation? I don't know what you mean by all that, but you don't believe that when he said it was done, that it was completed, and now all we have to do is be a living being? I do believe when Christ said it was finished, um, it is a reference to Christ accomplishing the work that the Father set as uh, he was a perfect sacrifice, but also lived the perfect life so that we may be declared righteous. And then his obedience on the cross um, is, is so that we may be justified and forgiven of our sins. And then when he rose from the dead, it vindicated uh, Christ in such a way that all of our sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven. Now when, it comes, now, when it comes to regeneration, regeneration is the work of the Spirit. He gives us a heart of flesh. The writing of God's work is ongoing. It's amazing. not uh, a moment. It's not an so instantaneous. So he was lying when he said it was done. No, when he said it was done, he accomplished, when he said it is finished. Right. He accomplished the work that the Father has said. And now we're free. Yes, we are free. But so you don't believe that the word of the Bible is the word from God, but the word of God is written in our hearts. I believe that the scripture. Do you believe that? Yes, the very no word that. of God, and that God is continuing to write His word on our hearts from the scripture. Really, that's amazing. How is He writing it through the scriptures? How is He writing what's in the scripture on our heart? It's the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God. The Scripture says illuminates us. The the psalmist says, um, uh, the unfolding of your word gives light and understanding to the sin, but the unfolding has to do with illumination. It, it gives light, it gives clarity. He says this, as I open the scriptures, light or truth, the Spirit of God brings the light of the truth into my heart from the pages of God's word. Amazing. Um, do you believe that Jesus is God or the Son of God? Jesus is God, but is not the Father. The Holy Spirit is God, but not the Father, the Son. So I hold to a Trinitarian view. So you don't believe he's the son, you believe he's God? I believe that he's always eternally existed as the son of God. So, so I'm black and slow, so forgive me, all right? <laughs> so do you believe he's the son or, or the father? He is not the father, but he is God, the son. He's so you say he's not the father, but he is the... There's, I hold a Trinitarian view. Have, we have one repeat God. That you said he's not the father, right? You say he's no. not the father? No. And is he the son, yes or no? Yes. But what the other thing you said he is? I said the Holy Spirit is God, but he's not the father or the son. The Holy Spirit is God? Yes. And, and why do you believe? So let's deal with God, for, with Christ first, and then we get to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So... Do you believe Jesus is the Son? Yes or no? He's the Son of God. And 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 then you believe God is God, the Father of Jesus? He's God the Father. Of they're, Jesus. They're three distinct persons. So God is God, Jesus is Jesus, and no, the Holy Spirit is Holy Spirit. He's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Where do you get that from? The Trinitarian view. Where do you get that from in the Bible? Uh, Jesus uh, himself attested to that. Jesus said, I'm God to God, and, 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 and Jesus the Son, no, no, no. and Holy Spirit, said, the Holy Spirit. He said, before, before Abraham, I am. Right. But when That's, did he say he was God? He says, I and the Father are one. When, right. He and the Father are one. But where did he say he is God? When he makes that statement, I am that I am statement goes back to Genesis chapter 3. But I am just meant there is no future past. It's now. I am now. I'm here. That's it. There's no past, no future. I am it. But where did he say he was God? He stressed that throughout the Gospels. And when he said that he's equal with the Father, uh, that is a statement in his deity, that is, that his deity is equal to the Father. Did he say, I am the Son? Um, scripture is referenced to Christ as the Son of God. And did he say, I am the Son? Well, we have to recognize that if we, I, I hold to all Scripture as the counsel to whatever um, God reveals. So the words of our Savior is on par 
uh, with the words that he spoke in Genesis. So whatever is spoken in the letters also helps us understand. Did so he in, say, I am the son? So in Philippians, I just want to give you this example. Philippians chapter 2, for example. Um, it, it says that Jesus Christ existed, although he existed in the form of God. He did not think equality with God was something to clutch onto. That statement in Philippians chapter 2 speaks of the co-equalness of the Son and the Father when it comes to the attributes that they hold uh, in deity. So we, we look at the whole counsel of the scripture to recognize um, the, 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 this aspect of the deed of, of God. Now, Jesus is said in John, uh, who the Son of Man sets free, he's free indeed. That could be seen in uh, various ways, right? Um, but I, I still do believe that there's a reflection of divine deity, um, that he's co-equal with the Father, but not just he, in the Gospels, but throughout Scripture. You never answered the question, did he say, I am the Son? No, he said that he is God. So you never read in the Bible where Jesus said, I am the Son? He said that he's God. But did he say, I am the Son? There are, there, are my question. There, are, there are allusions in the scripture where Christ refers to himself uh, for the sake of the audience as the coming one, as the son of God or the second person in the Trinity. So are you saying, yes, he did say, I am the son? There are allusions to our Savior referring to himself Why you not as, my question, man? as the son of God. Did he say, my father and I are one? Yes, he did. And who was he talking to himself? He was talking to the Heavenly Father. And so if he were talking to the Heavenly Father, why do you think he was God since he was talking to another guy? When he was praying. Why did he just say, you know what, I'm God. Because I'm God, I'm one, I'm it. The problem with that is then. But why would he, was he high or something? Why would he be talking to no, the Father if he is the Father? He's not the Father. If he is God. Why would he be talking to somebody else if he's, if he's God? Because they, they, they recognize themselves within this council of the Trinity as... They who? The personhood. But that's not what he's saying. Why not, why not go with what he said, not what some Trinity people the, saying? No, no, I'm not saying Trinity. I'm just using the term the Trinitarian doctrine. But where, that's because of time here, man. I love talking to you. I'm enjoying it. You having fun? <laughs> this has been good. It's amazing, huh? <laughs> 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 let me just say this, though. So, so let me just ask. Yes, sir. Just for time's sake only. Yes, sir. He did say in the Bible, I am the son. But he never said in the Bible, I am God. So why would you people make him God if he never said that? He made it clear he's the son. Why would you all make him God? Uh, because we're looking at other passages of Scripture. We're looking at the entirety of Scripture. Um, that uh, Second Corinthians, for example, chapter 5. I said that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. And then when you think of the incarnation, the incarnation uh, is God taking on human flesh. Um, Philippians chapter 2 talks about the incarnation. Although he was in the form of God, always existed, did not consider equality. In other words, the same substance, the essence of what it takes to be God, he has it, but he's not the father. Amazing, but he has the, the, those same, the same essence as the father, did not think that's something to be clutched onto. And then when you look at this, the, the scriptures teaching about the incarnation, it is God becoming flesh. Uh, the scripture says that um, you will call his name Emmanuel. You're going to call Jesus' name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So I think this scripture doesn't say, hey, clear in every passage. Here he is. This is his name. This is his title. It's, it's, a, it's speaking to the Jews who will make that connection from the Old Testament that indeed God has come in the person of Christ to rescue us from our sins because only God can save us. Let me ask this because of time. When Christ was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Mm -hmm. Was he talking to himself? No, he was praying to the Father. Once again, what three distinct said, persons. Was he saying to himself, why didn't he just say, well, you know what? I'm God. I forgive y'all. Y'all don't know what y'all are doing. Why he had to ask someone else to forgive them? Uh huh. The answer is that uh -huh. on, on the death on the cross, Jesus said these words: "My God, My God, why have you forsaken me?" Right. Who is he talking to then? There is a. There is a. Who, why would he forsake himself? There, there, there's some mysteries within the Trinity, I, I, and Not so to me, I reserve that. 
There, I, perce I perceive that there are some. But on the cross, you, you, you have a perfect sacrifice. And I believe in those displays, you have to make a distinction. Okay, is this... Is, is Christ exercising his human nature or his divine nature? Let because in the say, incarnation... Oh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm getting... Let's see out here. Let me know about that. Okay. Who would Jesus talk to on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Who is he talking to? He's talking to the Father. And so if he is the Father, why would he talk to somebody else calling him Father? Because Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He's not the Father. <laughs> But there are times when, when whether Jesus was it's... Going to, yeah, short essence now. When Jesus <laughs> was going up to short pray essence. to see the Father's will, who will, if he was God, why did he have to go off to find the Father's will? Because in Scripture, there's a distinction between who's operative. Is it the divine nature of Christ or the human nature of Christ operating? And there are many times, oftentimes, more than not, Christ exercised his human nature, not the divine. Amazing. Wow. Is it possible your intellect, which is of the devil, has deceived you? Deceived you? Um, deception is possible for anyone. So is it possible that your intellect, which is of the devil, has deceived you? My intellect is mine. It's not of the devil. So do you it's, think I, that it has deceived you? I'm created in the image of God, so my intellect um, is not the devil deceiving me. But yes, there, there are ways we can be deceived. That's why we search the scripture. Because there's we, nothing in the Bible the word about Trinity either. That's made up too. But that's it's a, a category that we a, use. That's a different subject for a different it day. Right. So let me ask, why do a lot of people hate the Jews? Do you love the Jews? I love all God's people and I love all people. Do you love the Jews? Yes. Do you absolutely. love white people? Yes. You love white people? Yes. And you love the Jews? Yes. Why do a lot of people hate the Jews? Well, what's rooted in, in the Jews is, um, is God's promise. They're a special nation. They're his chosen nation. They're the centerpiece of God's blessing and also conflict as a result of that. Is it the white Jews or the black Jews? Do, do you know the white Jews in Israel or the black Jews in America who think that they're the Jews? Well, that's just a lot of vitriol and hatred. I don't uh, find that to be reasonable, plausible, or true. Nice. Um, amazing. You know what? Because of time, do you support abortion? No. Is abortion worse than slavery? Yes. It is a, a wicked sin, yeah, a grievous sure. sin. Um, okay. Man, I'm out of time, but I got to ask you, I got to put you on the hot seat. All right. It's, it was, it's been hot the last hour, but okay. <laughs> I guess you're going to turn it up a bit more. <laughs> So I need you to answer these questions as quickly as possible. All right. The hot seat. What is love? Love is uh, the sacrificial giving of ourselves um, for the better of someone else. Do we need more white babies? We just need to stop killing babies and procreate. Should you ever tell a woman, should a man ever tell a woman his problems? I don't think that's a healthy idea. I think, <laughs> I think it can cause some issues. Yes. Uh, were women created to lead or to follow? Women were created to submit to godly leadership. Uh, did you take the jab? That's personal. No, I understand. I didn't. You did not? No. But don't ask any personal question that you don't want to ask. I know. I'm just teasing you. No, okay. <laughs> you did not take the jab? I don't want to, like, broadcast it to say it's right or wrong. I, I did not take it. I, nice. I wasn't convinced. Um, did, uh, did you vote for the Great White Hope? No, I did not. You know who the Great White Hope is? No, but I know Jesus Christ is my only hope. But you, you don't know who the Great White Hope is? Well, I don't believe in white. It's a racial category. My hope is in the Lord. So. Do you know who the Great White Hope is? Who is the Great White Hope? Donald Trump, man. What the? Sorry. <laughs> I, I will say this. I'm grateful to the Lord for some of the things he's done. Yeah. And, uh. I give God thanks for every leader, and I pray for those who are not saved that they may be saved. I just wish he'd make some changes when it comes to just his response and character. But did as you, far as his leadership and his decisions, he did a great job. Did you vote for, uh, uh, did you vote for the fallen Messiah? <laughs> who was that? Barack. No, I could not. My conscience couldn't lead me there. No. Nice. Did uh, Big Mama Michelle eat all the ribs? <laughs> <laughs> You asked him for rapid answers, but these are some, who is that? Big Mama Michelle. <laughs> she is the wife to the Father Messiah, Barack Obama. 
Did she do what? Eat all the ribs? All the ribs. Oh, I don't know. I, I respect women, so I, I, I can't answer that one. So you respect them so much you can't tell the truth about them? But I don't know what that means, though. So help oh, me I out. see. Uh, uh, did you know that July is White History Month? Um, I tend to ignore history months in general, so I wouldn't know about that one. You know, I started July as White History Month five years ago. Oh, you ago. did? Yeah. Okay, that's news to me. And you know why we celebrated July? White History Month? Mm -hmm. No, you tell me. Because July just feels white. <laughs> <laughs> no month feels white or black to me. I, I just wish we'll respect each other as, as image bearers and, and leave this racial nonsense alone. Yeah. Does a chicken have lips? Beaks. Does racism exist? No. True or false, abortion is worse than slavery? I would say yes, as I said earlier, I do believe it is. Yeah. Would you rather see, uh, who would you rather see as president? Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, Elon Musk, Donald Trump, uh, Big Mama Michelle Obama. I don't know, I have to give that some thought because I don't normally divulge my um, votes. I usually just say vote for the person who represents truth the most. Um, have you ever been high on the hog? No. <laughs> uh, would you ever run for office? No. There's the bear shit in the woods. You cursed. What? You cursed. That's a curse? That's a curse word. What do you mean? You use the S word. What? You just sinned. You are no longer perfect. <laughs> Amazing. Did you have fun? This was good, man. Thank you. That was challenging. I, I appreciate the questions. It gives me a chance to pause and think of some things some more. So right on. I appreciate, appreciate that. it, man. Yeah. Tell the, and tell the folks how they can get to your website or whatever you want to promote. Okay. I'm now the pastor, the teaching pastor at Grace Community Church of Long Beach. You can go on our website. It's graceoflongbeach.org. We're currently meeting at the Los Alamitos Community Center. That is our 10911 Oak Street in Los Alamitos. 1030 services, a Sunday morning, Lord's Day morning. Then first and third Sunday evenings at 6 p.m., we exposit the scriptures because we do believe God's word is the answer to the world's needs. Amazing. Well, thank you for coming. Thank you, sir. Appreciate the time. Yeah, and thank you all for tuning in. Don't forget that the Fall Day is now on Locals as well, Locals.com. So click the, the little tab there in the description, link in the description to support our work. Check out our merch, amazing merch. And let me hear from you, and thank you for your support. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Amazing. Appreciate it. Yeah.